What's up, everybody? So I was digging a hole the other day, and this made me think about the Genesis story and other creation stories. And it actually seems quite genius to me, though I don't know if making a video about it will be. <laughs> but sometimes all these connections like these will just flash through my head from a simple observation. So we're digging this footing and we get down to clay. I don't have the best picture of it here, but you have a couple of feet of topsoil and then you hit clay. And this happens just about anywhere you dig. You either hit clay or rock. Here it's a couple of feet of topsoil, but like in Southern California when I was building there, it was a couple feet of sandy soil. And then you would hit the hard packed clay down below that. There's articles online about finding clay for pottery. And they say you dig down two to three foot pretty much anywhere and you're gonna hit clay. And especially anywhere where the ground has been disturbed, like where the road's been cut in or a river bank, then you're going to get through the surface layers and find clay. Now let's look at Genesis and the Babylonian creation myth and see what they say. Now in Genesis, if you're unaware, there are two different stories of creation there, possibly describing two different creations. I don't know. But just one example of the two different stories is in Genesis 1, it says God created every creature of the sea and everything in the water. And then he created the wild animals and the livestock. And I should have started a little earlier. This is Genesis 1.25, but let's go back to Genesis 1.11. And it says, let the land produce vegetation and all plants and trees. So all of the plants and animals had already been created. And then in Genesis 1.26, it says, Let us make mankind in our image, in our likeness. And so God created them male and female. Thus the work of the heavens and the earth were completed, and on the seventh day he rested. That's the opening verse of Genesis 2. Then Genesis 2.4 starts all over and says, This is the accounts of the heaven and the earth when they were created. Now, no shrub had yet appeared on the earth, and no plant had yet sprung up, for the Lord God had not sent rain on the earth, and there was no one to work the ground. But streams came up from the earth and watered the whole surface of the ground. Then the Lord God formed a man from the dust of the ground and breathed life into his nostrils. Now, I think the King James Version says clay from the ground, but it's generally accepted that Adam was formed out of clay. And it's a lot easier to read the NLV here. But in this creation story, there were there was no vegetation, there was no animals, there was nothing. He created Adam first. Where in Genesis 1, he had already created all of the vegetation, all of the animals. Now in the Enuma Elish, it says that Ninma created humans from clay. And kind of an interesting side note is the idea that God ordered chaos and didn't create something out of nothing. There's a big difference there. But here's what I thought was so genius about the idea of creating the first man out of clay. If you go with the idea that nothing had been created yet, no, no living organic material, no trees, vegetation, animals, or anything, then you've got the idea of a barren landscape, just rock, sand, and clay. The Enuma Elish says that they mixed clay with the blood of a god to create the first man. But you can think of this metaphorically as creating life in general. And that's the tricky part here is it takes life to create life. You can't get life out of nothing. With all of our technological advancements, we can't take an inanimate object and breathe life into it. Even the soil that gives life to trees came from other life. Let's look at the forest floor, and you can see the root system growing all through that good, nutrient-rich soil. It's nutrient-rich because it's made of decomposing organic matter. The leaves fall down, the trees fall down, they decompose, they eventually just turn into the soil. And what you have here is the ages-old, what came first, chicken or the egg conundrum. The tree has to have that soil in order to grow, but you have to have a bunch of dead leaves and trees to make the soil. So how did the soil get there to grow the first tree? I was just giving you a second to think about that. Don't look at me for answers because no one in the history of mankind has ever answered that. That's seriously how big of a puzzle this is. At least no one has definitively, positively answered it. 
Okay, so here is the perfect illustration of what's going on in my head. So you see the top foot or so there of organic topsoil, right? That is basically the sum total of everything that has lived in that area, including the animals. You know, the animals come through, they eat the grass, they poop out the extras and keep all the nutrients needed for life until they die. And then they either turn back into that same topsoil or they're eaten by another animal that then turns those nutrients into all of the necessities of life. But the combined aggregate of everything that has lived in this area is right there in that top foot of topsoil. And then you've got a foot and a half of small rocks and gravel. How did that get there? Even though a lot of my views are heretical antichrist to most people, I'm going to be that guy and say the Bible actually answers all of these scientific questions. Because, well, it actually does in a subtle genius way. Or I'm just reading way too much into a footing I dug the other day. The second creation story, Genesis 2-5, says, Now no shrub had yet appeared on the earth, and no plant had yet sprung up. For God had not sent rain, and there was no one to work the ground. But streams came up from the earth and watered the whole surface of the ground. So it could have been a complete aqua world. I don't know. And that's one of those weird things where scientists don't know where all the water came from. They, they don't know a lot of things they think they know. And just so you know, in the last decade, I've read all of these articles about ringwoodite being found deep in the earth and it's porous so it contains all this water turns out it's more than all of the oceans of the world so the waters of the deep are down there but all that aside no shrub had yet grown so there was no vegetation but water did spring up from the earth and we've got these all over the place here where i live it's just honeycomb limestone caverns with rivers running all below us so all of this water is springing up from the ground, and then it gets cold, and what happens? Well, then you got glaciers, and especially up in the mountains, where a lot of the exposed rock has been pushed up. These glaciers weigh as much as continents, and so they're slowly grinding this rock, and they're busting all of it into small rocks and gravel. Then all of the ice melts, and you have torrents of water going downhill so fast that it carries all of these rocks with it. Then they get all washed out and form a gravel bed. So I think that's a pretty reasonable explanation of why there's a foot and a half of rock here. And I'm talking on a monumental Missoula flood scale. And then what's below that? Just lifeless clay. So you see how all of this makes a lot of sense? Or am I just crazy here? <laughs> Let's run this backwards. The earth is barren. No vegetation has grown yet. And bam, here you got the clay. But the water did spring up before any life was created, so you've got the crushed stone here. And I would almost bet that they're in close proximity to a mountain here because what you usually have is just the clay, barren, lifeless mud down at the bottom, and then life was created. Every bit of topsoil there is all of the life that has ever existed there. And that's the big mystery. How did it go from lifeless clay to life? When you look at it from this perspective, it doesn't look like life has been here for very long. That, or it hasn't been that long since all of the topsoil's been scrubbed. Now, let's go at this from two different directions. Back to all of the gravel here. All of this gravel got deposited and then life came afterwards. And all of the water went away because if water had still been moving all this gravel, it would have eventually ground it down into sand. That's why you've got sandbanks all along the river, all along the beaches. All of that sand is ground down mountains like the Missouri River going all the way from the Rockies down to New Orleans. Rivers all around the world are grinding rock down to sand and then it flows out into the oceans and you get sandy beaches. And ever since this sand has been here, there's no life. But there might be life below that, and it's just covered up with the newly ground down sand. Going at this from the other direction, let's talk about the topsoil. If a half centimeter of organic matter is deposited each year, then you're looking at, what, a thousand years worth of life here? It doesn't look like life's been here for long. But if you get a heavy rain or a mountain lake burst, 
then all of that topsoil gets washed downstream and gets deposited where the water slows down. So in places like the Mississippi Delta, you can find soil 40 feet deep. That doesn't mean that life has been here longer than here, because all of this could have been washed away fairly recently, and that's what adds up to that 40 feet down in the Delta. And that doesn't have to necessarily happen fast. That can just be that every time it rains, it picks up a few more particles and then deposits them downstream. But now let's say that there is a gigantic flood that picks up whole forests along with all of the topsoil. It scrubs all of the organic matter off of the clay or rock down below. Is it possible that that could have happened? Yep. It seems like all of these coal seams that we mine are ancient deposits of organic matter. And these miners were probably really surprised when they found this because they're mining anthracite. We're used to charcoal, like the briskets, but they're mining anthracite, which is a, evidently a compressed, petrified, organic mass. But if you were mining this, you would think of it more as a stone than as an ancient forest. But, you know, what do you do with anthracite? You burn it and you can release a whole bunch of energy and utilize it. And it's this black hard rock. Now look at oil. It's another substance found in the earth that you burn and utilize the energy from it. But that subject is opening up a whole big can of worms I'm not going into. But I would say that this coal deposit is what you get when a huge flood comes along and washes the entire forest away and deposits it in one specific area. The thickest coal seam in the world is 80 feet thick. So you can just think of how much of this eight inches of topsoil here it would take to reach 80 feet thick because it all got washed downstream like the Delta having 40 feet of soil. Then the next big thing is this is in Wyoming. Wyoming is what, an average of 6,000 feet at least elevation. You can see it's up towards the top of our current watershed, but evidently it was where all the water flowed down to at one point. And then some of these coal seams start at 90 meters or 300 feet deep. So this has been going on for a long, long time. And it's because of all those deep deposits that I don't just look at this and say, see, life hasn't been here very long. What I think is life hasn't been here very long this time. I think this is what happens when an entire forest gets washed away and deposited in one area. And this is what happens when a forest is in the lower elevations and buried in muck when all of the stuff comes flowing downstream from somewhere else. So either way I look at this, it's been going on for a really long time. Anyway, I kind of got going off in all kinds of directions, but I do think it's pretty ingenious that they describe Adam, the first bit of life on Earth, as being molded out of clay. Because that's generally what you see when you dig. You have the lifeless clay down below, and somehow life got started, and you have the remains of all of that life in the top one foot of soil. So I don't think that it's just a coincidence that they say the first life was created out of clay. But then the mystery of that is the second part, in some versions anyway. They say that they mixed the blood of a god with the clay in order to make the first life. So then the question becomes, what is the blood of a god? But that's probably about enough out of one hole. <laughs> And just so you know, you don't have to worry about subsidence very much if you dig down and hit clay or bedrock, because that's been compacted since before all life began. Well, this time around, anyway. Static out.